in today's episode. Is the Billy Graham rule above reproach? What do I mean by this question? It's been suggested by many holding to a biblical sexual ethic that the Billy Graham rule is a prudential rule of thumb intended to mitigate the temptation for sexual sin. But is this true? As I've discussed and interacted with Christians over the years, I've found there are two basic interpretations of this rule. Either it's a blanket, hard and fast rule, or it's a good thing to consider in particular circumstances with particular people. The former interpretation comes from Billy Graham himself, and the latter is just an assumption about the content of the rule. Making prudential boundaries for oneself to be used in particular circumstances with particular people is not at issue in this episode. By its very nature, boundaries require an act of discernment. The Billy Graham rule, on the other hand, requires foregoing discernment and is for motivations that demonstrate it's a rule not above reproach and therefore unchristian. Join me, Carrie Baldwin, as we dare to think about the Billy Graham rule. First, what is the Billy Graham rule? Billy Graham rule, renamed the Mike Pence rule, is the nickname of the first point of the Modesto Manifesto. I didn't name it. In 1948, Graham held a series of evangelistic meetings in Modesto, California, together with Cliff Barrows, Grady Wilson, and Gregory Beverly Shea. Graham resolved to, quote, avoid any situation that would have even the appearance of compromise or suspicion, end quote. This rule stood for 70 years until Billy Graham published his autobiography, in which he claimed that he was not an absolutist in the application of the rule that now bears his name. In his autobiography, he relates a lunch meeting with, of all people, Hillary Clinton, that he initially refused on grounds that he does not eat alone with women other than his wife. But she persuaded him that they could have a private conversation in a public dining room. Proponents of this rule have told me that the Billy Graham rule is not a blanket rule, and it's only about interactions behind closed doors. But that's not how the rule was used, and his exception to the rule was not made known until 70 years later. Yet Hillary Clinton, ironically, a person with whom no one should have any sort of relationship with, managed to persuade Graham to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction in public. But yes, Graham's rule was intended to be a blanket rule to include all women in professional settings, an exception made for probably the one woman in the world everyone should avoid if they value their life. So, should Christian men adopt the Billy Graham rule? Let's begin with those men who are expected to be above reproach, pastors. Here's a little thought experiment. Imagine, my Christian brothers, you need pastoral counsel or confession of sin you send your pastor a text message or call him or email him. You don't voice this request to church because you want to keep it private since it's not a public issue. It might even be a problem with your wife and you don't want it getting back to her. Your pastor agrees to meet with you at the church, at his home, behind closed doors, no pastor's wife or other elder pre present. You get to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, confess your sin, receive pastoral counsel and walk away reminded that you're forgiven and may go and sin no more. Congratulations, you participated freely in one of the great benefits of the covenant communion of the church. Now, imagine your Christian sister needs pastoral counsel or confession of sin. She sends the pastor a text message, or calls, or emails, if she knows it. She also doesn't want to voice this request at church, since it's not a public issue. Should he respond? Maybe he can BCC his wife. He doesn't want to keep secrets. Maybe BCC an elder, just to be safe. Maybe he notifies her husband so he can be transparent. Already, there's a potential problem, especially if the woman is seeking counsel about problems in her marriage. When he responds, he says he'll meet, but she must do so in the presence of his wife or another elder. Why? Well, to avoid appearances of impropriety. So, what? He doesn't trust his Christian sister not to turn counsel or confession into a sexual favor? Oh, no, 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 no. He would never suspect her of that. He just wants to remain above board. So what? He doesn't trust himself to not turn counsel or confession into a sexual favor? Should your sister hold him suspect? Oh, no, no, no. He's above reproach. He'll assure her. He just wants to protect his wife. So what? His wife doesn't trust him? 
Oh, no, no, not that either. He just wants to avoid false accusations from others. So, what? He's worried someone will sin against him by bearing false witness about his regular duties as a called and ordained servant of the word? So, where our Christian brothers can go receive counsel and make confession without any suspicion of impropriety, which might as well be a rule thrown out the front door now that there are so-called side B pastors and gay Christians. My Christian sisters and I must be chaperoned because moral omnipotent busybodies have a personal problem with sinning by bearing false witness. Tell me again how this Billy Graham rule is not like Islam, because second-class citizens of heaven is not a biblical category. And if you believed the historic orthodox doctrines of the Christian faith, you would not need to segregate women into a second class. I mean, women don't have women pastors they can go to for pastoral care. Implementing the Billy Graham rule creates a de facto second class for your Christian sisters. That's unbiblical. Okay, thought experiment over. Do you know why church officers are called to be above reproach? Ordained officers are not men above accusation or critique. They are men above being guilty before God of false doctrine or conduct unbefitting an elder. Those are two very different things. Many evangelicals act as though being above reproach means no one can accuse or criticize them. That's not the case. From the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, Biblical Qualifications of Elders, quote, No one should be able to lay a charge against an overseer and make it stick. To be blameless does not mean that one is able to evade accusation or conviction. Rather, a man is blameless or above reproach when his words and conduct conform to the holy commandments of God in Scripture so that he cannot justly be accused or convicted of any sin. The Scripture says that Job was, quote, blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Job 1, 1, end quote. Do you remember the story of Job? Job didn't avoid any situation that would have even the appearance of compromise or suspicion. Those situations were brought to him. And we know why they were brought to him, to test Job, and Job endured them. He endured false accusations, rumors, and stood the test, even when he decided to try and take God to task for allowing those situations to happen to Job to begin with. 1 Corinthians 4 and 5 speak further. I've excerpted from those passages that Paul writes for brevity. Quote, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you, then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil persons from among you. End quote. 
Being above reproach means quite specifically that officers are not guilty of sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, reviling, drunkenness, or swindling. And it also doesn't mean you evade the accusation of these things. Paul is essentially promising officers you will be falsely accused. His response? What of it? Unless, of course, there are officers among you who are guilty. What Paul says is not to disassociate from the world, but to disassociate from those who are guilty of these sins who bear the name of brother. They are, in fact, to go into the world to preach the gospel to the sexually immoral, greedy, swindlers, idolaters, etc. But among their own ranks, as brothers, officers, they are to purge the evil persons from among you. If you're called by God to bring the gospel to a dying world, a world full of sin, misery, rumor, and false witness, your character must be such that you are not guilty of sexual immorality or greed or idolatry, reviling, drunkenness, or fraud. Not that you're avoiding the possibility of accusation altogether. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Dare to Think. I'm Carrie Baldwin, and I'm an independent researcher with a degree in philosophy. My mission is to rethink prevailing paradigms in politics, religion, and culture. Please consider subscribing to Dare to Think on your favorite podcatcher. Also, please go rate and review Dare to Think on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or Amazon. This will help others find my podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date on my latest articles and episodes, please subscribe to my monthly email list at mereliberty.com slash sign up. Billy Graham created his rule to evade accusation or conviction, not to demonstrate his mature character that marks qualified men called for ordination. What Graham conveyed in that rule was that he was not above reproach that his character was not mature enough to withstand false witness. Men who fail the biblical qualifications for elders are already a liability before God and so are not called. An already ordained officer exhibiting these disqualifying behaviors should be removed from office, not cajoled. If you can't be blameless in the presence of any woman not your wife in any situation, then you are by definition not above reproach. You disqualify yourself. A false accuser is just that. Within the church, false accusers should be disciplined. But if a credible accusation is brought, the accuser has a right to be heard. Calvin explains more, quote, Paul is not merely directing Timothy as to the sort of men he should choose, but he is reminding all who aspire to the office that they should carefully examine their own life. Even Jesus says to those who commit the sin of lust to gouge out their own eyes, in other words, take responsibility for their own sin, not handicap all women around them so he doesn't have to be concerned with taking responsibility for his own sin. Matthew 5, 28 through 29, quote, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. End quote. And before you tell me that women are responsible for your lust because of how they look or dress, I'm going to stop you right there and suggest you go watch R.C. Sproul's sermon on the tyranny of the weaker brother. You are called to mortify your own sin, not mortify your sister, and that notwithstanding your sister's own sins, which she must also mortify. This is one reason why Reformed women are challenging NAPARC de- denominations about the behavior of certain church officers. Quote, no one should be able to lay hold of him or assail him or reproach him because of his sin- sins, whether in speech, conduct, or doctrine. Certain congregations bend or ignore these qualifications. The pastorate is not for everyone. Eldership is not for everyone. Obviously not for women, but more importantly, not for all men. For qualified, that is limited, restricted, or modified, men only. In fact, the gender qualification in scripture is a passive one, that he must be the husband of one wife. This qualification has more to do with having a healthy Christian marriage. That's the subject. Do you know what it means to love your wife as Christ loves the church? Because if you don't, how can you be an under-shepherd of the good shepherd? What's implied, Socrates, is that only men are husbands. It is more important that a church officer know how to love, honor, and be loyal to one woman for life than it is that he merely have male genitalia. The biblical qualification doesn't read, elders must be male with no more than one marriage commitment to another Christian. So a pastor cannot be ordained and be guilty of sexual sin or the other sin Paul lists to include greed, idolatry, reviling, I'm looking at you, Genevan Commons, drunkenness, or fraud. 
The liability becomes obvious when we speak correctly about the proper standards for ordination. A pastor exercising the Billy Graham rule because he fears a woman will falsely accuse him is simply unfit for ordination. He disqualifies himself. The pastorate requires mature character, so he knows what's appropriate or not, so he is surrounded by others of mature character for wise counsel. If there's a substantial, credible accusation against him, you remove him from office. The integrity of the office hangs in the balance. You don't slap him on the wrist or turn a blind eye and then clutch your pearls when you find women leaving the church in the wake of such a failure. You don't say, well, brother, you struggle with this very tough sin. I guess we should shield you from half your congregation just in case you're accused. What the Billy Graham Rule is not. Proponents like to say that this rule does three things. First, they say it prevents third parties from suspecting that an illicit romantic relationship exists. In other words, avoiding the appearance of evil. This is what we call a moral hazard. The second thing they say it does is protects against any future accusations should the other party become embittered and seek to attack the innocent boss. This is known as a legal hazard. The third, they say, is to protect both parties from developing natural affections and potentially falling into adultery. This is a sexual hazard. The Billy Graham rule is not about considering particular circumstances with particular people. It is about treating all women in all situations as moral, legal, and sexual hazards. What about the Christians who really do struggle with sexual sin? Newsflash, not all do. If you are a Christian who struggles with sexual sin, then it's you who are the moral, legal, and sexual hazard not all the women around you, or men. As a consequence, perhaps you require stronger boundaries, and that's appropriate. That's not at issue in this episode. You're a particular person with particular circumstances. The awareness for your own sinful hazard demonstrates a degree of spiritual maturity. You lose that maturity if you demand all women bend to the conditions of your hazard. Boundaries are rules you make for yourself based on your particular vulnerabilities in particular situations. Discernment is the process of exhibiting keen insight and judgment, and that's something Christians are called to do. The Billy Graham rule is a wall that removes any opportunity for actual discernment. So even for the Christian struggling, it misses the point. Because if you are the one who struggles with sexual sin, then you are making every woman the problem by employing the Billy Graham rule. If there is a particular person, other than you, who struggles with sexual sin, it's still not an exercise of the Billy Graham rule to maintain discerning boundaries. That is a particular person with particular circumstances. If you are operating on a rule that you process through with keen insight certain circumstances with certain people, assessed on a case-by-case basis to ensure you remain above reproach, then you're practicing a valid boundary with discernment. By definition, this will not look the same in all situations, and therefore is not the Billy Graham rule. What about the weaker brother? Shouldn't Christians take certain added precautions on the chance that any brother struggles with sexual sin? Again, this is a particular person in a particular circumstance. It is not the case that all men are hopelessly, perpetually guilty of sexual sin. This is a lie peddled by the patriarchalist and purity culture types. Ironically, this is the same group of people who erroneously interpret 1 Peter 3, 7 as women being the weaker vessel. You can't have it both ways, guys. You can't claim women are always weaker, and also that they must bear the burden of a universal weakness of men. This is intellectual and spiritual laziness. The Billy Graham rule is simply not above reproach, and no Christian should follow it. Because the Billy Graham rule is in fact a blanket rule, removing the proper role of discernment in the life of the Christian. No Christian can practice it. Even those Christians who struggle with sexual sin could not employ it in the manner Graham and the Modesto Manifesto intended. Should healthy boundaries based on consideration of certain people in certain circumstances be practiced? Yes, absolutely. That's a healthy Christian thing to do. But the Billy Graham rule is not this. I was asked by a listener if I thought the Matt Chandler incident that happened about a month ago would have a, quote, chilling effect on officers providing pastoral counsel to the women of their congregations. This question alone implies the underlying assumption that I've demonstrated here in this episode. That is that the Billy Graham rule is detrimental to women in particular. So my answer to the listener is this. The Matt Chandler incident will only have a chilling effect for officers who are not already above reproach and therefore not really called. 
So if officers find themselves chilled, remove them. They are telling you they are unfit for ordination. And that's not in itself a bad thing. Paul called Christians to purge the evil from among them in 1 Corinthians 5. From those who claim to be our brethren. If this leaves you worried that it would create, or increase depending on how you look at it, but create a pastor shortage, then maybe it's time to also reevaluate the effectiveness of certain seminaries to provide and equip qualified men for their pastoral duties, as well as the call committees who make unwise and unguarded calls. This, of course, requires some honest self-evaluation for many professional academic theologians. I would say this honest self-examination is inherent in your vocation, especially if you are also ordained. But, lest anyone be fooled into believing your systems protect you, please think again. Your system is only as good as the people operating within it. I've seen too many officers over the past several years double down on disqualifying behavior of either themselves or fellow officers in the name of protecting the institution of the church. It's kind of hard to have the institution of the church without the members of the church. And disqualifying behavior is pushing people away from the church. Of course, the Billy Graham rule is easier. No one will have to examine themselves, their processes, their seminaries, or other ordinational standards and call committees. It can just require women be chaperoned to protect officers from legal liabilities and the difficulties set aside for the special office. Am I right? Thank you for listening to Dare to Think. This is the official podcast of my website, MereLiberty.com. At Mere Liberty, I publish all sorts of content which reflects on and teaches about truths written into the fabric of reality, revealed through scripture and God's created order, that appreciates and respects the complex, irreducible nature of that order, and aims at inspiring and reorienting human action toward freedom and flourishing. If you like what you hear and would like to get access to premium content, including lessons which walk you through the skills of being a deeper, more reflective thinker, please consider becoming a monthly member for as little as $5 a month. You can find that information at mereliberty.com slash membership. And please do leave a review of Dare to Think on Apple and YouTube and follow me on Facebook and Twitter.